Okay, I want you to think of one word to describe this year's presidential campaign. All right, I want you to think of one word, and at the count of three, we're all going to say our word together. All right, got it? One, two, three, divisive. Well, I heard mine, it's divisive. Both parties are having a hard time unifying behind their candidates. And what's more, the, the two candidates offer strikingly different visions for our country, and, and the polarization of our citizenry seems like it's getting worse, not better. For me, I don't like it. I subscribe to that Rodney King mantra, can't we all just get along? That's what I want to say. Can't we all just get along? After all, that's the Christian way, right? Or not? Into my desire for peace, my desire to smooth out the bumps of conflict between people and peoples, my hope for a time when conflict disappears, the Prince of Peace himself, Jesus, utters these surprising and surprisingly dissonant words in today's Gospel lesson. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Now, religion in our day, I think, has become pretty domesticated. Yeah, we probably don't like to talk about it in public settings. But I doubt that any one of your acquaintances is really offended if they find out that you attend church. They might have some questions. They might wonder why. But beyond that, it's probably fine. None of us probably pays a price for being a member of a church. It was not so for the first readers of Luke's gospel. They were followers of Jesus in a culture that was hostile to followers of Jesus. To follow Jesus was to question the religious and economic and even political status quo. It meant accepting as Messiah this itinerant rabbi who hung out with disreputable, unacceptable sinners. An itinerant rabbi who preached a message of love and forgiveness without condition. It meant accepting him as Messiah, one who looked nothing like what the culture held out as powerful or important. And that's not even the worst of it. Jesus' claim on his followers went beyond what they believed. Jesus demanded a new way of living. To be a follower of Jesus, the one who accepted and even honored the disreputable and unacceptable sinners, meant that you needed to do the same. Rejecting the easy temptation of judging others and instead inviting them into your lives. To be a follower of Jesus, of the one who preached love and forgiveness, was to practice the same. Particularly when it came to those who were different, people who differed even in terms of what they believed. To be a follower of the one who accepted and honored the disreputable, well, that's our calling too. When we got our heads wet in the waters of baptism, God claimed us as God's own. God gave us new life in Jesus. In, in Jesus' death and resurrection, we were invited to die to ourselves and to be raised to a whole new way of living. A way of living in which we would be given divine life. But we would then in turn ourselves become springs of that divine life for those around us and, and for a falling and hurting and dying world. And when we do that, we are bound to bump up against those who think that the way of Jesus is just plain wrong. There will be conflict with those who believe that the way of Jesus is just plain wrong. The way of Jesus tells us to welcome without condition those who are not like us, those who are hungry and homeless and naked. And every Sunday we get together and we tell these stories of Jesus who welcomed sinners and outsiders. And those stories told us that, that those outsiders and must become the object of our love and compassion. And Jesus tells his followers to return evil with kindness, to forgive without condition, to give generously what we have to others who are in need without expectation of return. 
And in short, we find that hard to do. It's almost like we want to figure out a way for Jesus not to really mean what he said. The novel Benediction by Kent Harrop takes place in the small town of Holt, Colorado, up in the bleak and forsaken northeastern part of the state. And in the story, Lyle is the Baptist minister who is struggling in this small town, struggling with a disappointing marriage and struggling with he, because he thinks he's better than being placed in this little God-forsaken place. But he's also struggling because the people of his congregation are not responding to his ministry. And in this story, Lyle gets up one Sunday morning in the pulpit and begins to preach from Luke, the place where Jesus tells his disciples to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, Lyle starts his sermon by telling the long history of interpretation of that passage that suggests that Jesus didn't really mean what he said, that, that he was speaking in hyperbole or metaphor. Because Jesus could not really mean that we love our enemies, could he? I mean, what kind of world would that be? And this is what happens next in the story. Lyle says, I want to say to you here on this hot July morning in Holt, Colorado, what if Jesus wasn't kidding? What if he wasn't talking about some never-never land? What if he really did mean what he said 2,000 years ago? What if he was thoroughly wise to the world and knew firsthand cruelty and wickedness and evil and hate, knew it all so well from firsthand personal experience? And what if in spite of all that he knew, he still said, love your enemies, turn your cheek, pray for those who misuse you? What if he meant every word of what he said? What then would the world come to? And what if we tried it? What if we said to our enemies, we are the most powerful nation on earth. We can destroy you. We can kill your children. We can make ruins of your cities and villages, and when we're finished, you won't even know how to look for the places where they used to be. We have the power to take away your water and scorch your earth, to rob you of the very fundamentals of life. We can change the actual day into actual night. We can do all of these things to you and more. But what if we say, listen, instead of any of these, we're going to give willingly and generously to you. We're going to spend the great American national treasure and the will and the human lives that we would have spent on destruction, and instead we're going to turn them all toward creation. We're going to mend your roads and highways, expand your schools and modernize your wells and water supplies, save your ancient artifacts and art and culture, preserve your temples and mosques. In fact, we're going to love you. And again we say, no matter what has gone before, no matter what you've done, we're going to love you. We have set our hearts to it. We will treat you like brothers and sisters. We are going to turn our collective national cheek and present it to be stricken a second time if need be and offer it to you. Listen, we... And then Lyle was abruptly halted. Someone in the congregation was talking. Are you crazy? You must be insane. It was a man's voice, deep-throated, angry, loud coming from over on the west side of the sanctuary near the windows. What's wrong with you? Are you out of your mind? He stood up, this tall man in a light summer suit, staring at Lyle. You must be crazy. He turned fiercely and grabbed his wife's hand, pulling her to her feet and gesturing angrily at their little boy. They came out of the pew and went hurrying back up the aisle, through the doors and out of the church. The congregation all watched them leave. Then they began to look around at each other. They looked again at Lyle. All right, what do the rest of you think? What do you say? Lyle was standing next to the pulpit now. I'm not afraid to say, you're a terrorist sympathizer. He rose up in the middle of the sanctuary, holding on to the pew back ahead of him, a big heavy set man. We should have never let you come here. You're an enemy to our country. The old usher who had been sitting at the back stood up now from his customary chair and came rushing, well, limping down the aisle. Wait, stop, you can't talk that way in church. The big man in the pews turned and looked briefly at the old man in his dark suit, shiny with age. Go back and sit down in your chair there, Wayne. I'm not talking to you, but I'm not staying in here. No, by God, I don't have to listen to this fairy tale on a Sunday morning. He looked around the room. And if the rest of you know it's good for you, you won't either. 
He shoved out of the pew and went out. The two Johnson women were sitting down front. Willa stood up, her white hair pinned in a bun, her eyes glinting behind her thick glasses. Ah, let them go. If that's how they are, let them leave in good riddance. We have to listen to what the minister is saying. Even if we don't agree with him, we need to listen and consider. We have to be civil to one another. No! A woman shouted from the back. You be quiet. You shut your mouth. What? No, I won't be quiet, Willa said. She turned around, looking at the congregation. I'm going to speak. Who's talking to me back there? Nobody answered her. Then Aline stood up beside her mother and looked around at the people. And now there were others who had begun to rise and glare at Lyle. And these people started to slide out of the pews and to turn up the aisles and to go outside. And at the back of the church, one of them, a man, stopped and turned back and yelled some profanity at the pastor. And then he turned and left, and left the church. Ah, conflict. The way of Jesus is not the way of the world. The way of Jesus is hard. And the way of Jesus is so hard that we want it not to be true. It's so hard that we spend a lifetime trying to live into it with our halting and doubting and wondering ways. And the way of Jesus forces some penetrating questions about the kind of church we want to be. I'll tell you the kind of church I want to be. I want to be the kind of church that stands up against the craziness of this world. I want to be part of a people of God who are formed to infiltrate this mad and violent and crazy and angry world with the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus. And I want our church to be a place where you do not come out of obligation, but become, you come out of need. I want our church not to be a storefront in the market of religious goods and services, but a place where you come to be encouraged and equipped and then sent again out into the world to make a difference. I want it to be the kind of place that you return to when living like a follower of Jesus creates division. Because it will. But it will also create joy. The one who sends us out was himself baptized by fire and died by crucifixion. And the crucified and risen one is with us and for us as we come to church to be reminded of our identity as God's beloved. We are claimed and loved. And only when we come here to be reminded again that we are claimed and loved, only then are we sent out again in mission to tell others in word and deed of God's love and grace and mercy for them as well. Division? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hate to say it, but yeah. Because when the way of Jesus bumps up against the way of the world, there would be friction. And where there is friction, there is heat. Where there is heat, there is fire. The kind of fire that Jesus spoke of. And in the midst of that fire, we follow in the way of Jesus. And God's work in the world gets done.